And welcome back to Started With The Mouse podcast. We are very excited to have our next guest with us. He is the voice that makes it magically delicious, the voice of Donald Duck, <laughs> Daniel Ross. I'm already so loving this episode. This is probably my favorite episode I've ever done. <laughs> no, hello. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. And we appreciate my your pleasure. time. My pleasure. Um, so I kind of shot my shot with Daniel here. He was on his uh, TikTok live and I followed him now for a couple of months. And I had just mentioned, like, hey, would you want to come on a podcast? <laughs> and luckily you were like, absolutely shoot me over an email. And it was, it was just done. So that was awesome. Thank I love you so talking much. to Disney fans, especially people who <laughs> found me on my TikTok. I mean, that's just like big ups to you. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're doing uh you're doing very well over there. I mean, I, I enjoy your content. My husband enjoys yeah. your content. I did want to ask you a question though. So I saw well, your that, TikTok. That's what we're here for. I, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> this is before we even get the introductions down or anything, but I saw on your TikTok, I think it was last night or this morning, WandaVision. What are you thinking about WandaVision? Because we just started watching it. Like we just binged every episode. <laughs> Oh, wow. You had the luxury of doing a binge. I've had to wait every week because I, I tuned in. I, I've been in a Marvel deficit for the past year, so I was so excited to tune in. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a big, like, MCU fan. I love the movies. I love what they've done in terms of the characters and the development and keeping the characters and the consistency. So the fact that they've been able to create something like that and make it so big and have such a, such an amazing budget and great writing and great acting, I, I really love uh, what they're doing. So when WandaVision came out and I saw the, the trailers for it, I was like, yeah, this is, this is a departure from what we're all used to, but <laughs> I'm going to give it a shot because I trust Kevin Feige. I trust Kevin Feige. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I've really been enjoying it. I really love it. I'm not a big comic nerd. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, I, I just don't have a big database of everything that happened in all of comic book history. So I'm discovering it for the first time uh, through through the TV show and through the movies. And I, I like it that way. Yeah. As are we, actually. Uh, so we actually, our, our last episode that we did last week, we told our fans that this is our first time watching all the Marvel movies in order. I have only seen two Marvel movies, so it's very new to me. Uh, we watched WandaVision and we binged it, and I, I told John, I said, I fell in love with it, and I want to fall in love with the Marvel movies, and I think we just finished Guardians 2, yeah. so that's where we're at in all the movies right now. Uh, I'm your papa, boy. I'm your papa. <laughs> just go live your life. <laughs> Star Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Kurt Russell was, uh, cast... <laughs> Oh, you're Yondu, yeah. Um what's his, what is his yeah. name? Ru Rooker. Michael Rooker, yeah. Michael yeah. Rooker, yeah. And he was in The Walking Dead as well, I believe, right? That's right. That's right. He yeah. played a pretty yeah. pretty bad guy in The Walking Dead. Oh, and he's a fantastic actor. Uh but he that really is not is. what we're here for. We're here for you, Daniel Ross, and to find out more oh. about you. Um <laughs> So um, we have been doing our podcast for about two years now. We're trying to grow our, you know, our fan base, I guess. <laughs> we have a small community of fans and we love having a Disney family. And we just thought bringing you on here would be so cool. And I think people hearing you and hearing your voice would be awesome. And I think it would just grow our fan base that much more. Um, so John has an icebreaker question for you. <laughs> All right. Let's this is it. a silly one. We're going to start out silly first, and then we'll get into the nitty gritty of things. So, um, so my question is: Has you have you ever messed with somebody at a drive thru <laughs> uh, Well, on my own, independently of of certain characters, I think you're you're referring to. Yes, absolutely. I, <laughs> I used to cause quite a bit of mischief when I was younger, uh, with various voices and accents, and. Uh, yeah, I used to do prank phone calls and get in all kinds of trouble for that with my parents and impersonate my teachers. Yeah, I used to do all that kind of stuff, but uh, not not with who you're thinking of. Okay. <laughs> I must use uh, my powers for good. I'm fine with that. I just figured that'd be a nice little icebreaker. Yeah. So <laughs> how long have you been doing this? How long have you been voice acting? 
voice acting i i've kind of come to the conclusion that i've always been a voice actor ever since i was a little kid i've always had fun playing with voices and doing accents and impersonating cartoon characters and things like that just to entertain my friends or just to entertain myself <laughs> and it wasn't until much later in life that i realized that's a vocation like that's a job you can have mm -hmm. and as soon as i discovered that it was like oh game over game over <laughs> <laughs> I need to try to pursue that, but I, I've always had a proclivity towards the the uh, performing arts, theater, musical theater, TV and film. Um, you know, I grew up in the uh, the D.C. Baltimore area in Maryland, and uh, you know, I would do extra work and stand in work on you know different productions that would come through, and I love to do independent productions, and I did a bunch of those, and then I started producing independent films so that I could act in them and just making my own opportunities. And about seven years ago, I just decided, hey, I want to take a shot in Los Angeles and see what happens. So I quit my job, said goodbye to my friends and family, and, and moved on out here for a chance at the Hollywood dream. And uh, here we are quacking for a living. <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously, that has been going in your favor. So congratulations on that. Um, I'm glad Thank you're living you. your dream out there because I it's a you're lot of hard work, every... I'll tell you that. I'll tell you yeah. that much. You're doing what everybody dreams of doing, though, is following their passion, and I commend you for that. I really do. Thank you. Um, Thank you. <laughs> so how long have you been voicing Donald Duck, though? Just over five years. Uh, just okay. over five years. We started with Mickey and the Roads to Racers. Uh, now we're doing Mixed Up Adventures, Mickey Mouse Mixed Up Adventures. Chippendale's Nutty Tales, uh, <laughs> Hot Diggity Dog Tales, the Disney <laughs> Junior on tour. Uh, yeah. we, we've been doing quite a bit of work and some stuff I can't talk about quite yet. Um, oh. But yeah, just over five years. And um, I've been doing the voice ever since I was a little kid. It was probably the very first voice I ever learned how to do because my mom taught me how to do it. So uh, <laughs> that's been a thing between us for, for years and years and years. And when this opportunity uh, uh, fell into my path. I that was just so magical between the two of us. Real Disney magic, to oh, to yeah. say the least. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm just grateful to be doing this. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, I'm, I always say I'm borrowing the keys to the cabin cruiser for as long as Disney <laughs> lets me. So I, I'm just grateful and honored to be doing that for as long as I'm allowed. Oh, well, we hope you continue to do it because you do a fantastic job. <laughs> um, I love this. I love this. <laughs> <laughs> You're fantastic. Um, so what other characters have you voiced and um, who has been your favorite? Ooh, you know, people ask me what my favorite voice is, and I kind of have to say, I love all my children. I love them all. <laughs> uh, and because I really do. There's a, there's a story behind just about everything uh, in my career. And, you know, the, the first big one uh, was back in 2006. I don't know if you can tell for, for, the, for your viewers, I'm a big Transformers fan. I have a very large oh, okay. behind me here. Yes. Uh, I've been a Transformers fan my entire life, and when I heard that they were doing a Transformers movie, a live-action movie, around 2005-ish, I was like, I have to try. I have to try to be in this. <laughs> and so I I got my first job voicing uh, Starscream for Transformers the game. <laughs> Decepticons! <laughs> this is Starscream. Make for the rendezvous point. The old spark will soon be ours. <laughs> yeah. So that was like my first big gig, and that got me on the convention circuit and like meeting other voice actors. And, you know, once you meet the people who, who are doing the things that you want to do, it's like you find your tribe. And I loved voice actors. I just, I fell in love with voice actors. They are some of the most genuine, exciting, warm, incredible people you will ever meet. And I was like, this, these people are me. This is me. I want <laughs> to be like these people. So uh, that was part of the decision to, you know, double down and move to Los Angeles. And so when I moved here, I was working overnights at Target, managing the logistics process, all the trucks coming in, the freight going out, probably the hardest job that you can possibly have in retail. <laughs> and I did that 10 p.m. to 8 a.m. every single day, 
it was great because I had my days free, so I could audition, I could network, I could go to parties, and I didn't have to like swap out shifts. But I was just exhausted all the time, uh, and in really great shape because I was losing <laughs> a marathon. But on my last day working at Target, I made the decision: I'm just going to pursue voiceover. I'll drive for Lyft on the side if I need to. That day, I said my goodbyes. I'm driving off the parking lot. I booked Lucky the Leprechaun. So wow. my agent calls me as I'm driving off the parking lot at 8 a.m. and says, you booked Lucky. So I, I literally tell people, I got lucky. Um, <laughs> that was just a sign for, for me that, uh, that I was doing what I needed to do. And the decisions I was making were the correct ones. So I took it as such. And uh, from then on out, it's just been logically delicious. <laughs> Fantastic. I, you know, my next question, I think you alluded to it a little bit. Uh, you said you have been, you've been doing impressions, voice acting since you were little because your mother. And yes. was that when you knew that you wanted to be a voice actor or was it the time seven years ago that you moved to Los Angeles that you were like fully in this and that's what you wanted to do for the rest of your life? So, you know, I, I wouldn't say like, oh, this is the one thing that I want to do forever. I, I still love the performing arts. As as someone who watches my TikToks, I love creating characters. I, I love physical comedy. Those are things that I really enjoy. And so I, there was never a conscious decision like this is the only thing that I'm going to do. But what I said to myself was, I'm pretty good at this. I, I know what my capabilities are. I know where my talents are. I know how to put that out there. So let me take these tools and resources that I have. Let me go to Los Angeles and I'll give myself a goal of five years and I'll see where I am in five years. And I always said, you know what? I have airline miles. If, if worse you know, comes to worse and I need a ticket to fly home, at least I have a ticket to come home. But I said, I'm going to give myself five years and see what happens. And uh, so far, so good. So far, so good. But it is it is a very diverse world uh, in voiceover, like in terms of knowing people and, and networking with, you know, producers and writers and casting directors and agents, uh, other actors. There, there, There's a multitude of different people that are in my periphery and in, in my sphere all the time. So to then go and say, okay, I'm going to do on-camera work, it's kind of the same thing. You've got to know all the agents, the managers, the actors, the, mm -hmm. the producers, the writers. And I, my brain is so full as it is, and I, and I love what I do. So at some point, I would love to get back to doing on-camera work, uh, but I do produce films. Uh, mm -hmm. I had a short film called The Distanced uh, that was recently released on YouTube, so it is for free. Uh, it's a short film uh, based around the quarantine with uh, some sci-fi uh, notes in it. And I play a mysterious scientist. Ooh. So, um, you know, I do it where I can, but my focus and my energy really is in voiceover. Yeah. We'll have to give it a, uh, a watch. And yeah. then next time Please we have it. the follow-up, then we'll have to <laughs> talk to you about it. <laughs> <laughs> I would love that. <laughs> um, okay. So... The process of voice acting, I, I don't think it's a simple one. So how did you begin that process once you got out to L.A.? And um, what was the follow-up question? And how can current artists that want to become a, a voice actor start that process? So, yeah. So I came out here, uh, you know, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, green behind the ears. And I was like, you know, I got this acting thing down. Nothing's going to stand in my way. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. And one of my buddies uh, said, you should take a workshop with this great lady named Debbie Derryberry, who you would know as the voice of Jimmy Neutron. And oh, was, that's oh, awesome. Yeah, okay. I'll take a workshop. I'll see what that's all about. And I take her workshop and I walked away going, I know nothing. I know nothing. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Ever since then, I've been taking workshops left and right because I learned very quickly that you must continue your education. There's never a point where you're just really good at it and that's it. Because you got to keep up with the trends. You have to keep up with the people who are in the industry, actually working in the industry, training from those people. So I learned that very quickly, and Debbie became one of my fastest uh, best friends, and I love her to pieces. Hi, Debbie, if you're watching, I love you. <laughs> Let's um, hope she's watching. <laughs> so she she has been a, a great friend and mentor. Uh, my other mentor, David Sobolov, 
uh, the voice of Gorilla Grodd on The Flash and uh, many other Transformers roles. He has this amazing, rich, deep voice. Uh, these are the people who really uh, solidified uh, my decision that this was something that I could do. They believed in me. They gave me training. They gave me insight. And uh, I, I am forever grateful for that. For people who are interested in getting into voiceover, um, there are a couple of prerequisites. You have to study acting. You have to study acting. It's not just about doing funny voices. It's about fully embodying a character, knowing the physicality of that character, being able to communicate without body language, without mm -hmm. using your hands to show what you're doing or eyes to wink, you know, and, and, mm -hmm. and do certain things. So you have to take all of that away and still be able to communicate the same way. And that requires skills that mm -hmm. I, I didn't have when I first got into it. So I started with musical theater, which is big and broad, and you have to speak to the person in the back of the room, and then to film where everything is internal, and what do I do with my hands? You know, less is more. So I went from that transition to film and then to voiceover where you take everything away, and I had to relearn the craft. I had to relearn everything. So getting a solid foundation of acting is crucial. I also would say study improvisation. If you like the show, uh, Whose Line Is It Anyway? That's a great learning tool. The, the, the people who perform on that are amazing, like Wayne Brady. I, I mean, just absolutely incredible. But improvisation is really important because you have to think on your feet constantly as a voice actor. You have to be able to offer choices that the writers or producers or directors weren't anticipating. When you're auditioning, you have to find out how to stand out from the rest of the crowd. So improv is absolutely crucial. And then I would also suggest uh, check out D. Bradley Baker's website. Uh, amazing voice actor, does all the animal noises that you hear. Um, D. Bradley Baker's website is IWantToBeAVoiceActor.com. Great resource for anybody curious about the voice acting world. So that would be what I would say. Learn your instruments, awesome. know what your capabilities are, study acting, yeah. study improv, and go visit D's website. No. You heard you heard it from the uh, Daniel himself. I mean, <laughs> um, okay. So you had said that um, one of the hardest things is not having the body language whenever you're acting in front of a camera versus behind a microphone. Would you say that that is the hardest part of voice acting, or is there something that is a little bit more tricky than that? So, in terms of technique. It's one of the more difficult things. Obviously, there's microphone technique, being aware of the distance between your face and the microphone, being able to uh, uh, stay put and actually do everything into the microphone when you're trying to do a performance. There are certain ex exclusions to that, like something called PCAP, where you have a headband and a microphone on you and you can physically go through the mo movements of the scene. Different than mocap, where they're capturing your physicality. This just gives you the freedom to be able to perform. Um, so there are some variations to that, but generally in animation and video games, uh, it's you in front of a microphone and you have your director and you have the writers or producers or the creative team behind the show uh, or the game or the product uh, giving you direction or getting into fights because they want to give you different directions. <laughs> so, um, you know, the, the, the technical performance side is one facet of it. But I always say the business is the hardest facet uh, of voiceover. You really have to have a thick skin to get into it because you're going to get a lot of rejection. There's going to be a lot of people saying no. I audition probably on average like anywhere from three to 500 times per year. Wow. And I will book maybe 1% of those auditions. So that can be very discouraging. It, it, it sometimes feels like you're screaming into the abyss and there's no there's nothing coming back your way and you just have to persevere and continue with it and continue your training so that you know what you're sending out is professional and bookable mm -hmm. so you know it's just a matter of kind of playing the lottery it's like uh you know uh pull on the lever on the slot machine every time you audition <laughs> you never know what's going to happen mm -hmm. and in the case of me with donald duck I, I never thought that would have ever happened in a million years. And there was an audition, there was a callback, there was another callback and another <laughs> callback, and then I got it. And it was like, hey, here's here's uh, a completely different life for you. My life mm -hmm. was changed. And I, I, would, I would have to think that that 1% of the callbacks that you get make it that much more rewarding. 
oh yes absolutely <laughs> like i love all the characters i've played and there's a story behind all the characters because those moments are so special to me they're so special to me all we want to do is work that's it you know there's there's a rare few who are like i'm in it for the fame and fortune but this, we just want to work doing what we love and so anytime we get that opportunity uh that's my favorite character at the moment is the one that i'm voicing <laughs> <laughs> and we are happy that you are voicing him and that we get to talk with you uh thank i'm you. just i'm just gonna keep thanking you throughout this whole interview because that's i'm fine. just so keep grateful it keep it <laughs> thank you yeah. thank you yeah. <laughs> um so have and this might be a silly question, but for people like us, we don't know what the process is behind voice acting. Is there ever a, a chance that you have to voice in front of a camera, but it's just your voice? There have been a couple instances where, uh, like for auditions, where I've had to do it in front of the camera. Mm -hmm. um, and there are a couple situations where they'll ask to record you during the process. Uh, to give the animators cues, uh, like physical cues, like if your face does something that they weren't expecting during the performance, they might want to animate that in. They might want to incorporate that into the character. But most of the time, no, it's just you in a room with a microphone and on the other side of the glass is your voice director, uh, director, uh, producer, writer. Usually that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I think you answered this. I, I, I think that would be much more difficult versus acting in front of a camera where you're able to express yourself and see yourself and see, you know, your director and their, their facial expressions of if you're doing well or not. I think there's, there is a difference between on camera and voiceover in that when I'm in front of the microphone, it doesn't matter what my face is doing <laughs> as long as the is, is correct, as long as they're getting what they want. Whereas if you're in front of the camera, you're going to be very mindful of, of delivering your lines that you had to memorize, uh, uh, making sure that you've made choices as to what you're physically doing. So there are different uh, thought processes behind each. Um, but I would say for, for voiceover, you know, generally speaking, I don't have to memorize my lines. Uh, that, that's something I'm, I'm grateful for. Uh, because memorizing is a whole other technique that takes years to to accomplish and master. Um, I always have the reference in front of me. But in terms of, you know, picking apart the characters and, and learning the intent of my lines, you know, there's always prep work that goes in beforehand. So as an example, when I go in and I voice Donald, um, I'm going back and watching all the old Clarence Nash cartoons. I'm, I'm looking for cues as to how he would respond to different stimuli. You know, what happens when a when a chipmunk throws an acorn at him? What kind of sound does he make? You know, what happens when he when he pops a pill that gives him a brand new voice and he can say, Oh, Daisy, I'm going to marry her. You know, like what happens to those? What does it sound like when he chuckles? What does it sound like when he does a belly laugh? So, you know, part of my job is to do that research, read through the script, decipher all the comical uh, uh, cues and make choices so that when I get into the booth, I have something to offer. And, you know, sometimes they'll have other choices. They'll say, let's try this or let's try that. And so we collaborate together and, and the final product is what you end up hearing. So it's very involved, it's very involved. And I really okay. do like to take the time to get into the head of my character to focus on the acting aspect of it. It's one thing to do a voice, it's one thing to maintain a voice, it's another mm -hmm. thing to create a full, a fully embodied character with wants, desires, uh, uh, you know, pain, opportunities, just a, a full picture of a real living, breathing uh, person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so with your research, when you're, you're looking into what kind of sounds he makes and how he reacts to things, are you keeping it as authentic as possible or are you kind of doing a mix on it of your own, you know? So that's an interesting question because uh, when we started Mickey and the Roads for Racers, part of my direction was we want the kids to be able to understand Donald as best as possible. Mm -hmm. So part of my job was to enunciate as clearly as possible with that character voice. Uh, the technical term is buckle speech. That's what we call uh, Donald voice. Okay. So my job was to try to do that as clearly as possible to brighten the voice just slightly so that it was more readily uh, 
available for the younger audience, for the Disney Junior audience. So there, there is a slight difference between my take on Donald Duck and, let's say, what Clarence Nash had done. <laughs> but, you know, when I auditioned, I was doing Clarence Nash. And I can get back to that version of the character if I need to. Uh, but for the Disney Junior content, there's a, a very specific sound that they were after. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's really cool to be able to pronounce things uh, that normally Donald does not pronounce. In fact, there was a cheat sheet that Clarence Nash had come out with with all the words that he could say and the words that he couldn't say so that the writers would have a tool uh, to, to be able to work more efficiently. And I, I never had to use that. Uh, there were only rare instances where the writers would, you know, pose something to me and I'd say, this is, I, we have to rewrite this. Most of the time I just say yes and we do it. And it's great. I love being able to do that. Um, I will say this, the first three to four months of, of performing as Donald, uh, I was in my head all the time. The the weight and the pressure of the the rich history of this character, this this world renowned character that has been around for generations. Uh, you know, I knew about Donald Duck. My parents knew about Donald Duck. My grandparents knew about Donald Duck. My great great parents knew about Donald Duck. So, so to fully embody this multi generational international sensation. Uh, no pressure, right? Um, <laughs> no, no, no. I was very much in my head and I cared so deeply about the character and the fans. I wanted to get it right. So after about three, three to, I would say like three to six months, I know my, my, my numbers are changing here, but about three to six months, I stopped hearing myself. It was me stepping in front of the microphone and Donald was just coming out and I'm just like, wow, this is cool. Yeah, you do you, Donald. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was a, it was a very surreal experience, but I knew that I was doing my job correctly uh, because I just disappeared into the role, and I was very happy about that. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, who who would you say has been your biggest influence when um, you know auditioning for these characters? Who do you who do you find yourself looking back on and, and saying that 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 is who I want to impress the most? That's who I want to be proud of me? Um, in terms of influence, I, I don't really draw a lot of influence. I, I obviously look to the greats like Mel Blanc, June Ferre, Dawes Butler, you know, the people who really paved the way for me to have this kind of job in the first place. Uh, I look to those people and, and I certainly hope that I am you know, doing that continuing legacy of being a voice actor, good. Um, but, you know, we all kind of have a little bit of imposter syndrome. You know, we always think we can't, we can't be doing this. This can't be real. You know, I'm not that good or I'm not doing this or I'm not doing that. We always get in our heads. That's just a creative, that's just a creative thing. Um, so I just, I look to my mentors, you know, Debbie, David, uh, E.G. Daly, David Kay, I, I mean, there are so many incredible, Rob Paulson, so many incredible people in this industry that I look up to, and I'm fortunate enough to call, you know, a peer, colleague, and even friend. And when you meet your idols and you get to perform with them and they look at you as, as being on the same level, uh, there, there's nothing that quite beats that. There's nothing that quite beats that. So when I go in and I do my thing, I am focused on just doing the best job that I can. If I need to hearken back to a certain type of voice, like let's say, oh, they want an Ed Wynn voice or something like that. <laughs> you know, I might go back and say, okay, I'm going to go back and look at Ed Wynn and you know, try to you know, fully envision like him doing this role. So different, different things. But when I get into the booth, it's just, it's just me and the microphone and all of the practice and experience that I bring to it. And I hope that's enough. Absolutely. I, I definitely think so, for sure. And I have to say something because I don't think my husband will say this. Whenever um, I had told him that there was a possibility that we were going to get to speak with you, I think he felt how you felt to actually talk to one of his idols because his favorite character from day one has been Donald Duck. So yeah, it's it's you it's, and me it both. You and me both. <laughs> <laughs> it is truly an honor, and I keep saying that, but I just want you to you know, know how much we appreciate you. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I'll tell you something. I used to go to conventions 
you know, transformer conventions. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> I used to go to transformer conventions and I would meet all the voice actors from the show that I loved. And that was a magical experience for me because I just remember some of my fondest memories sitting in front of the TV as a young kid, enjoying that content and having that be a part of my world to see the person who gave that experience to me and say thank you. That was magic to me. So mm -hmm. to step into this side of things and and to hear that, you know, from Disney fans, I, I almost don't believe it sometimes because I'm like, <laughs> I'm just another person. I'm just a dude. I'm just a dude. <laughs> You know, and, and, you know, that's me in my bubble here, but there are repercussions. There are positive repercussions because of these characters. I, I always say that cartoon characters are the anchors to our innocence and our joy. And they are uh, uh, things that will stay with us forever. So to, to evoke those kinds of feelings from somebody and have that be part of my job, to be able to spread some joy into this world because we all know we need some of it, especially right yeah. now. Yes. It's just a, the honor of a lifetime. It's the honor of a lifetime. I'm so happy that I get to do that and make, make some people smile. That is just, that makes it all worthwhile. All the hard work makes it all worthwhile. Yeah. I, I can't imagine having such a rewarding job as you do. And I, I hope that one day, you know, my husband and I find that. And I think doing this podcast and, and having the opportunity to talk to people like you is, is kind of, it's kind of, we're on the right track, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, it's always fun to talk to people. This is why I love TikTok so much because I get to interact with people on my page and, you know, just have fun and, and create some smiles and that level of interactivity. Uh, is really nice. I, I feel like, you know, the currency these days is authenticity. Mm -hmm. And when you get to just show that you're a real human being to people and and share in the love of mutual interests, uh, it, it's just amazing. Uh, what, a, what a day we live in. What an age. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you, you alluded to this earlier. Who has been the best who has given you the best direction in voice acting? And I think you had mentioned it. And forgive me if I, I, I don't, I think her name was Deborah, the, the voice of. Oh, Jim, Debbie Jim Derringer. Yes. yes. Was, was she the one who has, who has given you the best direction or has and there been others along the way? Um, in terms of direction, uh, education, friendship, uh, show, showing me uh, the way, answering questions when they're not easy to answer. Because, you know, sometimes, like, if you're at the job and, and something happens and you don't quite know who to turn to or who to ask the question of, to have somebody who's available to do that for me, uh, that, that's been my friends Debbie and, and David, for sure. Uh, but countless others. In terms of directing, like being in the booth, I've been working with a gentleman named Kelly Ward uh, for, for the past uh, five years on the Disney content, and he's amazing. He's incredible. Um and I've had the fortune to work with a bunch of other people, Daryl Van Sitters on Tom and Jerry. Uh, I mean, gosh, the, the list could just go on and on and on. So um, if you don't have any other questions, this I, might be yeah, my last question. That's fine. <laughs> and this might be kind of an open-ended one. How did okay. you find your voice? Ooh, I like that question. <laughs> um, Believe it or not, I, I actually teach a workshop about finding your voice because there's a process that I follow um, to basically discover what your voice print is. I think if you're going to get into the uh, entertainment industry, it's very important to discover what your strengths are, laser focus on what you're good at, and dive in head first. If you try to do a little bit of everything, you might accomplish nothing. So for me, I, I follow a 90 day process uh, when I teach this workshop. I won't give away too many of my secrets. You gotta sign up for the <laughs> workshop, kid. Um, but it's a 90 day process of discovery, making funny voices, getting a pen and paper, getting a recorder and just listening to yourself, listening to what your capabilities are, pushing yourself, seeing what you can and what you can't do. Um, that's really important. And then once you discover what it is that you can do, you can make that decision and say, you know what? My voice is really good for commercials. My voice is really good for, you know, high drama video games, or I might have a good voice for promo or trailers or audiobooks, narration, 
looping. There are so many different things that you can do in the voiceover world outside of just cartoons or video games. Although, of course, those are uh, a lot of fun. So once you've determined that, you just go at it full steam. You learn everything about that world. You start networking. You start educating yourself. And when you put that kind of intent into something uh, and dedication, you can find success. You can find success. Um, so I, I'm not going to say, take my workshop and you will find success. I will never be one of those people. <laughs> Results may vary. Uh, <laughs> consult with your doctor. Um, but uh, yeah, so so discovering what your capabilities are and then expanding upon that uh, and growing. I'll, I'll give you one example of something. So uh, hearkening back to Dee Bradley Baker for a second, he was the frog lady on The Mandalorian, or he was the voice of the okay. frog lady. And I'm watching the show and I'm like, I, I think I could do that. Let me. I'm like, oh, OK, I could kind of do that. Let me play with that. Let me shift it around my throat. See how it feels. Put it into my chest. Put it into my head voice just to discover what my capabilities were. And a couple weeks later, I had an audition for a, a frog monster. And I'm like, got this. <laughs> but I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't tried in the first place and discovered that I could do it and I could sustain it. So that's really the gist of the process. Mm -hmm. Discover what you're capable of and then start expanding on it. Good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I want, okay. So where can our listeners find you? If they want to contact you, if they want to watch or listen to anything that you have done, all of your work, um, social media, anything, this is you highlighting you. I want to hear every platform that they can find you on. I, I'm going to make it so easy for you and your listeners. You can find me <laughs> under... Actor Daniel Ross across all social media, TikTok, Instagram, the, the, the Twitters, the Facebookies, uh, <laughs> the Snappy Chats, all of those things. My website, guess what it is? ActorDanielRoss.com. Uh, that's where you can find me. Uh, you can find uh, contact information for my agents. Uh, my PO box is listed there. Uh, I'm primarily on TikTok these days under, you guessed it, actor Daniel Ross. <laughs> um, so I would love for you to follow me, uh, check out some of my content. I really try to lean into, you know, comedy and creating characters and just having fun with, with the audience that I've been able to uh, build over there. Uh, I really love TikTok. I really enjoy it. So uh, yeah, that's the best way to get a hold of me is either through my website or, you know, reach out to me through a DM on one of those uh, apps. I'm usually on TikTok more or Instagram. Uh, to be quite honest, but uh, yeah, that's 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 me in a nutshell. Oh no, I mean a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel Ross, thank you so much for joining us. We so appreciate you, and we are so grateful for you answering all of these questions for us. And uh, we hope to do it again someday when you come to Disney World, because we are going to hold you to that. <laughs> it's it would be my pleasure, and let's do it. Let's do yes. it. <laughs> I, I, think I mentioned before we started, I have never been to Disney World. How is that possible? Well, I, know. I was when I was one year old, but that doesn't count. That yeah. doesn't count. <laughs> I need to come. I need to come to Disney World and experience it because, uh, yeah, that would be amazing. Absolutely. Thank you but so thank much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Let's do this again. And to all of your listeners, uh, thank you for listening. I hope you have a wonderful day. Okay. <laughs>